What's up guys? Wanted to do something a little different today. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about what's been going on this week. Uh, things that my teams and I were talking about as we went through all the trades and everything. Um, I think this is super useful. If you're engineers out there, it's always cool to, to see what, what new things are coming down the pipe. And if you're investors out there, it's really good to keep your ear to the ground on what engineers are talking about. We're, we're generally a few years ahead of a lot of these things going public, so it's, it's worth taking a look at. Um, for you, all you engineers out there concerned about Core Web Vitals, Chrome 91 has a new Core Web Vitals overlay. I found this like super helpful because our company right now is scrambling to make sure all of our Core Web Vitals scores are in the green. If you guys aren't aware what Core Web Vitals are, it's these new metrics that Google released that are going to start affecting search engine results. Uh, so companies who really rely on their SEO and placement in those Google search results have been scrambling for a few months now to get these Core Web Vital scores in the green. What I find hilarious about this, though, this is the thing we love to talk about internally, is like Google is genius about getting other companies to do its work for, for them. So like they're so evil, dude. It's, it's, it's crazy, like an evil genius. But like uh, they claim that this is to improve user experience. But at the end of the day, we all know that it's just to improve the performance of their infrastructure uh, and their indexing capabilities. But it's hilarious how Google will periodically do this. They do the same shit with AMP pages. Uh, and so if you guys aren't familiar with AMP pages, it was another scheme released by Google to quote, improve the, you know, the load time and performance of pages never really went anywhere because the framework was too constrictive. Uh, I mean, it did go places, but it, it didn't take over or anything. The framework was super constrictive and a lot of people like me were like, well, we don't want to live within just your ecosystem for our sites. But it's funny to watch us all continually scramble to chase Google's tail as they make us. Uh, you know, refactor our sites and re-engineer our infrastructure to support theirs. Uh, but anyway, uh, this is pretty cool. If you guys haven't checked out Chrome 91, go ahead and, and check out the preview and enable the uh, flags so that you can start seeing these overlays. Uh, Google I.O. is going on right now, which is cool. Um, some notes on just, I haven't watched all the videos. I only got through like the first day and keynote basically. Uh, I have a playlist together of stuff that I want to watch. But uh, we were talking a little bit about how Chromebooks are, it's pretty crazy how Chromebooks have taken over schools and are becoming this massive, I think they've gained a huge market share uh, as a result of COVID. And I mean, it's, it's gradually been increasing, but there's some other trends that are coming that I'm going to talk about later that are really going to push Chromebooks over the edge, I think, in a lot of cases. Like, I think this this has only just begun. Um, so, uh, but that's cool to see that Chromebooks have really established themselves as the OS of schools. Uh, the other really cool development that I love is that WebAuthn is finally here and Google's has enhanced support for WebAuthn now. If you guys don't know what WebAuthn is, it's basically a flow that is passwordless. So you can log into sites and transact with sites without setting up a password. Uh, it's biometric, so it uses the device's biometric reader. Uh, it's part of the FIDO auth deal. Uh, so if you guys don't know what FIDO auth is, it's this industry consortium uh, that has been trying to solve the world's password problems for quite a long time. And, and they have some really good protocols they've developed that are now being rolled out, and WebAuthn is one of them. Uh, so I'm really excited to implement this on our sites and just get rid of passwords at a certain point. I really think that uh, in the next five years, we could see the end of, of password-based login for a huge portion of people. What's also interesting here is that WebAuthn, the, that style of a workflow was also implemented with crypto wallets. And so I'm interested to see how Coinbase here could potentially jump in on some of these innovations and start enabling better workflows like WebAuthn that are um, done on uh, through Coinbase wallets. So that's kind of interesting. While Google has a kind of monopoly on the device, we have to implement a lot of these workflows for specific um, devices and their implementations. Whereas like with crypto wallets, if we enable them through apps like Coinbase's wallet, it might be a little bit easier um, to where we're not. I mean, in theory, the, the protocols are the same, but it's not always the case. Um, so anyway, it'd be kind of interesting to see how Coinbase kind of looks at web authentic adoption and if they're planning to release apps that are similar. Um, there's new cookie, cookie restrictions inbound. So this is all part of that fallout of Apple not allowing cross app tracking. And so uh, Google has now positioned itself to pretend that it cares about privacy, which we all know if we've read their white papers and listened to their leadership that they don't give two shits about privacy. Uh, but they are working to um, restrict some of the practices that have taken place. They have um, uh, a non-web standard uh, based solution that is being rolled out in Chrome uh, that are going to create different types of cookies that you can set. Or check out the I.O. Uh, uh, talks on this. Um, but but the fact that they're not standards based is scary because it's this was like in the late 90s and early 2000s. We had our hands full trying to 
manage Microsoft uh, Ex Internet Explorer because it was basically its own sort of walled garden of, of implementations. And, and there really weren't open standards. I mean, they just sort of emerged at that point um, where browser manufacturers were adopting open standards and Microsoft wouldn't. But we can start to see these same dynamics take place with Google and Chrome where they're just running way out ahead of the standard committees. And so developers, keep your eye on this because it could make your life kind of harder. I know that we have really good abstraction tools that take care of polyfilling and transpilation and we don't have to worry so much about the implementation details anymore. That has its own set of side effects like increased bundle sizes and tooling and problems in your CI CD pipeline. So we shouldn't, like I'm happy about the fact that Google is finally addressing privacy because Apple made them, but like it would be really cool if we could have a more standards based approach to, to what's happening there. Uh, another cool thing out of Google I.O., Flutter gains momentum. Uh, I think Flutter's starting to get a little more traction. They had some really cool new features that I thought were, were pretty neat. Um, for those of you who don't know, Flutter's like this uh, abstraction language that lets you compile for multiple platforms and devices. And it's pretty neat, actually. The abstraction language is super efficient. It's semi-class-based, It's or it is class-based, but it's, it's, it's declarative. It's highly declarative, and so that makes it super attractive to me. Um, and it also can hit multiple platforms and deliver a solid user experience. So it can really, for a lot of startups, I think it, it could pay huge dividends because, you know, you don't have to like have separate teams building iOS and Android and web, um, which is a huge cost savings. But there's a danger here. Uh, this same shit happened with Flash. So like Flex was an old uh, Adobe tool that allowed us to build um, applications for Flash Player, but you could also compile them native. A lot of people forget about this, but... Flex had an output for native, uh, which included desktop. And so uh, iOS eventually banned it uh, just because uh, basically <laughs> Apple and Adobe were in a pissing match and, and Adobe lost. So, it, and, and it's in the FAQ. I will leave a link in the description that Flutter even puts in their F FAQ. Could, you know, will, will iOS ban Flutter apps? And they say, we can't speak for, for Apple, but we don't think they will. And, but anyone who's around for when Apple banned the transpilation of Flex apps, it could totally happen. It's a result of politics, typically. It's usually corporate politics. And with all of the problems now going on around um, what's going to happen with cross-app tracking and and this 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 sort of upheaval in the ad industry, which, uh, in case you missed it, Google like makes most of its money off ads. It's, it's changing. I mean, they are, they are starting to, to flip that, but it's still a huge portion of their business. I could imagine a day in which Apple and Google are fighting and I, Apple just says, well, we're not going to allow Flutter in the App Store. Uh, that would be kind of a big hit. Um, so be careful, like when you decide to adopt abstraction languages, just always remember that the official way to build these apps is typically to use the SDK tools that are created by the platform, and, and that's not Flutter for Apple. Um, so anyway, keep an eye on it, but it's pretty cool. Uh, latest episodes of serverless chats. If you guys don't know what serverless is, it's uh, it, it's really in reality micro VMs that allow us to, to have a sort of more fine-grained lease on infrastructure for cloud providers. Like we basically pay as we go for compute that we use rather than having to like reserve EC2 instances. Um, so it's, it's this sort of pay by the SIP model. Every time you take a SIP of the cloud infrastructure, you're charged a little bit. Rather than having to like pre-reserve a gallon of water, you can just take a little cup whenever you need it, right? So serverless is neat. It's been, it's also requires, a, it, it's way easier to get apps up and running. There's a lot less infrastructure you have to maintain because all of the underlying infrastructure is managed for you. And I've been, I've actually been involved with the serverless framework. Uh, I, I almost took a job with those guys. Uh, they're a great, comp great, great group of engineers, fantastic. Uh, but I'm a huge serverless advocate. But anyway, uh, the latest episodes of serverless chat, if you don't subscribe to this channel, check it out. Like if you're in engineering and you want to know what's going on in the serverless space, this is a great resource. The amount of subscribers is criminal in my opinion. They should have a lot more subscribers. The quality of the content's awesome. Uh, but anyway, episodes 101 and 99, I watched them. Uh, I thought 101 was a great, great recap on AWS Lambda and what they've been working on. Some really cool stuff happening there. And then uh, episode 99 was my favorite. So um, this was, uh, I forget the person's, the gentleman's name, but he's from Fauna, which is a uh, serverless key value store, which I love, dude. This thing is an amazing database service. But he's advocating for what he's calling the API economy. And this is something I think everyone should pay attention to because it represents a shift that could really affect people like AWS who've invested heavily in, in, in GCP in their amount of services they offer. The API economy looks way more appealing to me because I can pick a service I need to build my app for it to fulfill a component of a reference architecture. And it's 
it's cloud agnostic. I'm not tied to that vendor's implementation of that service. They can run it on multiple vendors. Um, and so this multi-cloud architecture where I pick a service like messaging or a database or streaming implementations in Kafka or messaging implementations in RabbitMQ, and I can run it on multiple cloud providers and essentially let, hedge my bets and have a more redundant and durable infrastructure as a result, I think that's the future. It's going to push our high availability way, way up. Um, and high availability, for those you don't know, it means like how resilient is my application? Uh, how, how, how many hours a year is it up for? Or, down, or sorry, how many hours a year do we tolerate it being down for? And higher HA is better because your customers don't experience outages and your app is more resilient. But anyway, this new API economy model, uh, I think, is really going to win the day. And uh, projects like Fly and Fauna uh, and Vendia, which we'll get into in a little bit, are really leading the way. So if you're into serverless, keep in mind that this, this API economy where we pick the services we need to fulfill a reference architecture, and then they abstract the, the deployment on the cloud provider from you, but you can choose to have multiple clouds, you deploy it to multiple clouds and interoperate, that could be the future. Uh, so pay attention to that. Uh, the a And again, the API economy is here. I'm like, I'm so excited about it. Um, you know, what's interesting, too, is as a result of the API economy, they're actually building their infrastructure to run at the edge. And the edge being all of the compute that's closer to the end user. Um, and that's really important as we try to in improve experiences worldwide and drive down latency in our applications. I'm experimenting with Fly. I, I, I kind of really like their deployment models. I, I deployed a proxy server out there along with the static website generator. And so far, good success. And it's actually looking like a really neat alternative to AWS. Cloudflare, I was, you know, has some really cool features you're all going to like to see here pretty soon that is going to look a lot like Fly, in my opinion. Um, so keep an eye on Cloudflare. I think they're they're probably the largest, most innovative uh, edge provider out there. And, and like their support of the blockchain community and Ethereum has been awesome. So keep an eye on Cloudflare. And Fauna is an amazing key value store uh, that you can use a lot like DynamoDB, but you're not tied to Amazon, right? So like I can run, I can have the benefit of a multi-cloud architecture if I want it, or will eventually get. Um, and and I'm not tied to one particular cloud provider's DB for my key value store, which is pretty much the thing that underlies all applications. It's like the bedrock, you know. It's it's the foundation of the skyscraper. You've got to have that that really resilient. Fault tolerant, um, you know, strong guarantees for your your database for your, for your database for your applications. Uh, so check out Fauna if you haven't. But this new API economy again, if you're an investor too, keep your eyes on these companies because they're really changing how we're building that software. Um, so yeah, and then uh, and so if serverless platforms and the API economy is the future, uh, is Vendia the future of serverless? So if you guys don't know what Vendia is, there's this guy Tim Wagner. He was the creator of AWS Lambda. And he left to um, work at Coinbase for a little while. I believe he was a VP over at Coinbase, VP of technology over there. Um, and then he started Vendia not that long ago. I think it was like maybe a year ago or a year and a half ago. Um, and Vendia is this really, like, this is what I've wanted to see for the future of application development, which is that I get reference architectures. Your infrastructure will spin up a reference architecture for me and give me everything I need to build my app, which would include like data streaming. It would include messaging. It would include a key value store. It would include um, uh, GraphQL, right? And and then also in, you know include maybe some some few forward looking technologies like blockchain, right? And and uh, and uh, smart contracts. And that's exactly what Vendia is. It's a reference architecture for building React applications or Angular applications, more broadly progressive web applications. And it gives you everything you need to build those. And in theory, one day it'll be cloud agnostic. And you could actually have multiple cloud providers. So I could deploy to Amazon, uh, I could deploy to Azure, I could deploy to GCP. But what's neat about it is all of the worthless code that doesn't add any business value to my application, all the infrastructure as code, that gets eliminated. I don't need it anymore. I don't need to maintain it. And I'm up and running super fast. I love that. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done here. I don't believe Tim has created, you know, viable reference architectures yet. Um, I think that it's, it, you know, the platform is a little bit naive in terms of its implementation. But I, it's super promising, and I'm really passionate about the work he's done. He's also really forward thinking about how serverless can be a true supercomputer and how we can actually get better performance and more mass compute on this new type of infrastructure that they're, that they're building. Uh, so keep an eye on Vindia. If you haven't checked it out and you're a developer, it's super easy. They, they're doing a developer, um, 
uh, they're, they're doing this like beta with developers right now and you can build what they call universal applications or unis. Um, so check that out if you haven't and, and it's kind of all braced for this new API economy and serverless revolution. And then to, to round things out and bring them full circle, StackBlitz now supports Node.js. So what is StackBlitz? StackBlitz is an online IDE that software developers can use to write code. Why is that revolutionary? Well, one of the things that's really problematic about everything in software development is the environment setup. How do you get a laptop configured to write the code and compile the code? This has all kinds of barriers that are being torn down right now by StackBlitz in a way that's never been done before. This is truly revolutionary tech. They compiled Node.js and WebAssembly, and it has all of these benefits, including enhanced security, that are going to unlock things like being able to teach how to do software development in, on Chromebooks, which you couldn't really do before, right? You needed to spin up online IDEs in AWS or alternative tools that are clunky. This is really going to drive forward this ability to teach software en engineering to underserved markets and communities, which is amazing. Uh, the, the other thing that is really awesome here is that by using these online IDEs, I can take my work anywhere. I, I'm not tied to a particular laptop or environment. And it solves the problem within the organization that we call out, well, it works on my machine problem. <laughs> and software development have to deal with it. Well, it works on my machine. It's like the most common way that developers kind of like the biggest source of frustration when we're trying to figure out the source of a bug or how to replicate some issue. By having a web-based ID in a web-based environment, all the environments are the same. We don't have any kind of weird library you installed over here that's causing or manifesting some issue. So that's also huge. Uh, but more importantly, it's a broader industry trend. Okay, so We've all been wondering when WebAssembly was kind of going to replace maybe some of the ways we build desktop applications. And it's been evolving for a long time. I think the earliest adopters were like AutoCAD had a WebAssembly version that ran in a web browser. But now companies like Adobe are building image editing programs. Um, there's also, I think Twig is based on WebAssembly, which is like a design program. And there's video editing done in WebAssembly, which means that the browser, like app languages like Rust, for example, and C++, we can compile these libraries that we already have and distribute them on the web and just redistribute our desktop libraries and have the browser use them natively. And that's really going to change how software gets distributed and how it gets developed. Uh, I think Adobe is the most forward looking here um, in terms of how, of how they're of mass market software that has a huge user base that is going to be maybe the first that gets uh, new tools that are all WebAssembly based. But Stackblitz, good on you. This is an amazing innovation. I can't wait to get my projects in there. There, there is an open call for developers right now. If you have a, an open source project, they would love for you to set it up in their new, if, to, if it's a Node.js based project, uh, to set it up and issue a pull request and they might list your project on their site and set up a uh, an environment for it. Um, so if you know, you're a software developer, go check this out. I'll leave links in the description, but yeah, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the weekly roundup.